You could turn me in your Bibles to the book of Luke chapter 12. And while you're turning there, have you ever noticed that today is the tomorrow that you worried about yesterday? The only advantage of being in today is at least now you know what you were worried about. You know, there are all kinds of people that live their life worried about their tomorrows. Mark Twain was once famously quoted as saying that he had spent a lot of time in his life worrying about huge problems, a few of which actually came to pass. Isn't it funny how oftentimes those things that we anticipate going wrong in this life are are worries about an uncertain future, have a funny way of stealing our joy today and then never really materializing tomorrow. The, The Bible tells us something really remarkable. We face a choice in terms of how we face the challenge of anxiety in this life. In the book of Proverbs, chapter 28 and verse 1, We are told that the wicked flee when none is pursuing, but the righteous are bold as a lion. Now, which of those two descriptions is closer to home in your life, especially living in times like these when we are bombarded with dire predictions, whether it's about pandemics, whether it's about climate change, whether it's about world peace, whether it's about the economy? Uh, You turn that off and you look at your life personally. A lot of people are worried about where they're going to be economically. Some people are struggling with health issues within their lives. Other people are worried about relationships that seem to be falling through their hands like sand. How can we adopt that bold as a lion stance rather than running from our problems like a bunch of scared mice? Well, in Luke chapter 12, Jesus is going to deal with this all too common but often unattended issue within our lives. In a study we could call How to Win Over Worry, we are going to see how this gift of holy boldness can be one that replaces the constant back masking music of anxiety within our lives. Three important insights Jesus is going to give us about living this bold kind of life, not reacting but responding to the challenges of life. First, we're going to see the definition of what holy boldness is all about. Jesus is going to give us a very interesting working model to use to be able to discover whether we're on track or not. Secondly, we are going to see the depiction of what holy boldness is all about, such an important issue in the eyes of Jesus. He doesn't just tell us about us, he shows us some things, some checkpoints, some mileposts along the way that can make sure that our hearts and our heads are in the right place regarding the challenge of being dominated by fear in our lives. And finally, we're going to see the decision of holy boldness, whether we're going to live lives of faith or fear, whether we are going to be overcome by anxieties or learn to overcome them. We're going to discover it comes down to saying yes or no, moment by moment, day by day, to the provision, the presence, dare I even say, the good pleasure of God, working out His plan and His purpose within our lives. So if you came in here today, uh, maybe feeling a little slumped over by a burden of worry and anxiety and care, God has good news for you. And believe me, in times like these, uh, facing anxiety, facing the challenge of worry is going to come knocking sooner or later. Forewarned is forearmed. Let's learn how not to be overcome by anxiety in these stressful days, but how to overcome it, the presence and power of our Lord. Father, we thank you this morning that we have this opportunity to be able to see uh, what I really believe, Lord, is one of the most practical areas of your word we could ever address, Uh, an issue in our life that is going to go an awful long way towards determining the quality of our life, even the quality and experience of our relationship with you. And so, Father, I pray for those who perhaps have been dominated by fear this week, that they would find your favor uh, through faith this morning. I pray, Father, for those who not only are worried about things that could happen, but maybe are worried about some things that are happening within their lives. I pray that they would learn to cast their cares on you because you care for them. 
But even more importantly, I pray that this study about dealing with fear would bring us face to face with how much you love us and how much you care for us and that you are a good, good father and that you are excellent at dealing with your kids. And knowing that is enough to chase fear away. Guide us now into your truth, we ask, and speak to us deeply on this essentially important issue within our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, Luke chapter 12 and verse 22 is where we pick up our study this morning. It begins with a very profound word in your New King James Bible, then. Now, if you hang out with us for any length of time, we are want to remind you that uh, one of the best ways to make sure that you're understanding the message of the Bible is to look for, well, these uh, little road signs along the way. Uh, Little dead giveaways that uh, can keep us on track. For instance, if you see a therefore in Scripture, you should always ask, what's that therefore there for? But in a similar way, whenever you see the word then, you should always ask yourself the question, okay, when is the then being referred to here? Well, what's just gone on in uh, the ministry of Jesus? If you were with us last week, we saw that Jesus had been laying out a beautiful picture of what it means to be a genuine, born-again member of his family. Having a right relationship with God straight from the master's mouth. And boy, if you and I had been there, we would have just been soaking up that truth and it would have been a beautiful thing, hopefully. But there was someone in the crowd, well, a man on a mission, if you will. A man who felt like he'd gotten the short end of the stick as far as a family's estate being settled is concerned. He wanted to get Jesus knee deep in the middle and said, uh, Master, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. His brother had been given the lion's share of the resources of the inheritance in the family, wasn't following through on his obligations. And so uh, this guy was going to appeal, in a sense, to a higher court, a higher authority, telling Jesus to settle the issue. Well, Jesus begs off. He says, Man, who made me a judge or an arbiter? over you. Now that strikes us a little strange, doesn't it? Is there there's ever anybody who could straighten out a family squabble? You'd think it'd be Jesus. You'd think the judge of all the earth would be able to do this in a New York minute. But Jesus begs off for an important reason. He said, take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of things he possesses. We saw that covetousness is a fancy bible way of describing something that's near and dear to all of us, that have more attitude. That's what the word covetous literally means in the original language, two words mashed together, have and more. You know, we say to ourselves, well, I'm sure I'll be happy someday, but it will happen when I have more than what I've got. Well, this have more attitude, boy, I'll tell you what, it can lead you down a road where the bridge is definitely out at the end. Jesus told uh, a parable about a man whose field produced uh, abundantly for him. And he thought within himself, saying, what shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, this I'll do. I'll pull down my barns and build greater. And there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will be those things which you provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Now, (laughs) covetousness, let me tell you something. This idea that if I just have a little bit more, I'm going to be happy. Here's a guy who got the more, right? Here's a guy who got to the end of the rainbow. Here's a guy who won the publisher's clearinghouse, if you will. He doesn't have to worry about money uh, in his life from that time onward. And guess where it got him? Nowhere, except maybe to a nice funeral or something he himself would never be, even be able to enjoy. That night his life would be required of him. Then all of these things that he had built up, all of these material ways to provide two things in life, security and significance, were going to be taken away from him. And let me tell you something, wherever you and I look for our security in life, ultimately, 
Wherever you and I look for our significance, what defines us, what makes us worthwhile in life, whatever your answer is to that question, ultimately, that's your God. That's why in the book of Colossians chapter 3, Paul warns about covetousness and calls it idolatry. It's trying to get from people, places, and things something only God can give to us. And so a lot of people run down that road. A lot of people think that they can, in a sense, fill that God-shaped vacuum that's inside all of our hearts with people, places, and things, and financial security, and just one more deal, and one more accomplishment. God says, no, I've got something better for you. And that's where we pick things up in verse 22. Notice, then Jesus said to his disciples, therefore, in light of all of this, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about the body, what you will put on. Life is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. Now, <laughs> I want to point out uh, a statement that Jesus makes here that some people have found, well, to quote Jack Sparrow from the uh, Pirates of the Caribbean movies, maddeningly unhelpful. Jesus' statement, I say to you, do not worry. Oh, come on. That's easy for you to say, Jesus. But you don't know what I'm like. You don't know. I've just been a worrier as far back as I can remember. I'm always thinking about this uncertain future that lies out before me. I can't seem to turn off my brain at the end of the day. I, I spend those long watches in the night thinking, what if, what if, what if? You know, a couple things about this. First of all, the fact that you and I can think about our future. Did you know that's a gift from God? You know, the, the, the idea that we can, by using our human imagination, look at what's going on in our life and speculate, sometimes accurately, sometimes not, about what might be lying down the line isn't necessarily a bad thing in its proper place. Like any other emotion, okay, this idea of anxiety, this idea of worry within our lives uh, can be used in a positive sense. It's a great servant. If you feel anxiety within your life, you feel uncertain within your life, if that is something you use as God's not-so-subtle tap on the shoulder saying, you know what? You're trying to control your life in your own power, your own strength. Right now you're acting just as if I don't exist. Maybe it'd be a good idea to give these situations and these strains and these, these concerns over to me. I can handle them. You can't. If that's what anxiety and worry does for you, then good on you. But for the most part, when we get involved with anxiety, with worry, with stress, uh, it's not really acting like a uh, servant in our lives. It's acting like a master. You know, in Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 3, uh, we read this. A prudent man foresees evil and hides himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. Great to anticipate possible problems in the future. Great to, in a sense, you know, set aside some money for your retirement someday so that you're not a burden to your family. Great to, say, in a sense, uh, make plans for your last will and testament so that your uh, loved ones don't spend all their time fighting over your stuff when you pass from this world. That's all well and good. But that anticipation of an unseen future can easily take over our lives. Uh, the American Psychiatric Association even has a name for anxiety run amok in our life. It's called GAD. <laughs> like GAD, oh my goodness. Generalized anxiety disorder. It's when we are so worried about things, we end up in a case of paralysis by analysis. We spend so much time worrying about a future that we don't live in catch this, we miss out on the blessings that God has for us in the here and now. And that's a subtle but very crucial decision that we all make sometimes without even realizing it. Jesus said in this respect, I say to you, don't worry. Don't go down that path. Why? Well, look at verse 23. Jesus said, <laughs> reality check, 
Life is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. You see, worry tends to magnify in our lives when we focus in, catch this, on what we don't have, rather than focusing in on being thankful for the things that we do. Now, Jesus mentioned something very interesting here. Don't worry about your life, what you'll eat, or about the body, what you'll put on. Life is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. Notice, food and clothing. Jesus emphasizes these two issues within our lives. He says, you're already way ahead of the game. Because first of all, you're alive. (laughs) Understand this. Life is a miracle. And guess what? You've got a body. Your body is functioning today. You know, oftentimes we don't appreciate the marvel and the miracle, the amazing blessing that is our body until something goes wrong with it. I call this pinky toe syndrome. Have you ever ever spent much time thinking about your pinky toe? I bet you didn't spend any time thinking about your pinky toe today. I don't think about my pinky toe until I happen to be walking across a darkened living room and catch my pinky toe on the coffee table. I don't know why God has designed the pinky toe in this way, but there must just be an incredibly dense bundle of nerves in the pinky toe. Because you catch that pinky toe and nothing hurts worse, right? than when you catch that pinky toe on a coffee table. I bet you don't ever think about your pinky toe. I bet you don't ever think about your pancreas. I bet you don't think too much about your lungs. I bet you don't think too much, really, even about your brain until something starts going wrong with them. And then these things that we take for granted every day, this marvelous symphony that has to happen in just the right pattern, in just the right order for you and I just to live another day. We don't think about that. We think about all the external stuff, and God's going, right now, I want you to know I'm doing a miracle. Your life right now is a miracle. And guess what? If you're alive and kicking, you got a body that's functioning, you're blessed. And guess what? God will even bless you Beyond all of that, he'll give you food and clothes. Yeah, let me ask you a question. And and I think this is one of the things that fuels anxiety and worry within our lives. Very important question to ask yourself. How much is enough for you? How much does God have to give to you in order for you to experience what we call contentment? Did you know that the Bible tells us that there is a level of contentment that we all need to set as our default position if we're not going to allow worry and anxiety to take over in our lives? And it's a fascinating one, maybe one that's very different from everything that our culture teaches us on the subject. In 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 6, we are told, now godliness with contentment is great gain. You, You want to be really rich? This is where it's found, godliness with contentment. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. (laughs) Understand something. Here's what God promises you and me. He promises us food and clothes. If you got food and clothes today, with these we should be content. Now look out in this auditorium right now. And uh, I can make a couple assessments here. First of all, all of you are clothed, and thank goodness that you are. Secondly, I look out here, and it doesn't look like, generally speaking, too many of us have missed very many meals lately. We've had food and clothing. Guess what? If you've got food and clothes, from God's point of view, that's the level of contentment. Now, catch this. If you've got anything more going on in your life... Then food and clothing, the Bible says you're rich. You're wealthy. Now, I know we don't think of it that way. You know, Scott, I got food and clothing and this clunker car that, you know, I I really don't like very much and the ride's rough and all that. You've got a car. I often think about that. Every once in a while, especially this time of year, where, you know, the thermostat is going up here in Tucson. 
I'll be driving along in my car, and I'll be thinking about, you know, oh, you know, my car, you know, I just had another, you know, repair on the struts and all this other stuff, and something's always falling apart on it and all of this. And then this thought dawns on me. Yeah, but it sure beats walking, especially right now. Could you imagine having to walk home right now from church? You're wealthy. You're blessed. You got transportation, food, clothing, transportation. You got a roof over your head. Guess what? You're wealthy. God has given you above and beyond that food and clothes line of contentment. And when we have that as our level of contentment, when I wake up in the morning, when I look at my life and I go, guess what, God, I've got food, I've got more food than I know what to do with. I'm not going to be going hungry today. I've got clothing. Uh, you, you've, you've done that for me. Guess what? I can be content with that. And anything else I look at is gravy. Anything else I look at, I go, man, God, you've been doubly good to me. Changes the whole mindset that we have. Changes the whole way of thinking that we have. Jesus said, don't worry, right? And uh, he tells us, that this is God's mission in our lives. Anxiety and worry should not be taking over in our lives. Now, this is a challenge. I know there have been times where, you know, I've seen the Lord, say, miraculously provide for the, the welfare of our church. I've seen God minister a, a work of healing in the lives of those who I love very dearly. I've seen God's supernatural intervention. And during those moments... I find myself experiencing just that, that wonderful lull of, of, of contentment and trust in the Lord. Like, oh, God, you're so awesome. You really did have it after all. And maybe you have too. Stop and think about those times where God really stepped in and saved your bacon. I mean, he has come through for you, hasn't he? But the problem that we run into is this. We have those moments, but uh, as the old saying goes, the problem with life is it's so daily and life is filled with distractions and all kinds of things that says get your eyes off of God and his provision and get your eyes on all the problems and all the what ifs and could be's. How do we keep our focus? Well, Jesus is going to give us three ways to keep our focus, three touch points, if you will, three GPS experiences in life that can remind us just how invested God is in our lives today. Look at verse 24. There Jesus said, Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which have neither storehouse nor barn, and God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? Now, a couple things here. <laughs> Jesus points out not just birds, but a particular species of birds, ravens. Ravens, as you know, are kind of crows on steroids, and I'm told they're a very intelligent uh, kind of bird. They're, they're, they're a bird that actually enjoys teasing other animals and such uh, things like this. But another interesting thing uh, about ravens, first of all, uh, you know, God's taking care of the ravens. Well, to the Jewish mind, ravens were considered unclean birds. You never had, uh, you know, uh, uh, raven uh, wings while you were watching a sporting event. Uh, you, you just wouldn't eat raven. And, and I mean, we kind of, I never want to eat one of those things uh, either. And, and so they're kind of low on the bird totem pole, if you will. The other interesting thing uh, about ravens, there's an interesting reference to them in uh, Psalm 147. In Psalm 147, uh, speaking about the provision of God, we read this, Sing thanks to the Lord, give thanks to the Lord with thanksgiving. Sing praises on the harp to our God who covers the heavens with clouds who prepares rain for the earth, who makes grass to grow on the mountains. He gives to the beast its food and to the young ravens that cry. Now, of all the animals that the psalmist could have pointed to as far as God taking care of them, he points to the young ravens. Apparently, ravens are not known for being great parents. As a matter of fact, ravens have a way of kicking their babies out of the nest in a way that we would look at as human beings and go, that little bird ain't ready. That little bird ain't going to make it. You know, we have these uh, doves that build uh, their nests in the overhangs here at the church. And, and every once in a while, a little baby dove will fall out of the nest. They'll be down there, you know, kind of flopping around on the ground. And I'm like, oh, you know, and you, you know, I always come back and get like a paper towel because I don't want to mess it up. And I try to get it back up there with the mama and all of this. 
Well, I guess ravens are famous for doing that. Ravens will kick their babies out of the nest. The average person, well, that bird ain't going to make it very long flopping around like this. But guess what? Ravens haven't gone extinct, have they? <laughs> Even though they're horrible parents, kick their kids out of the nest way too early by our lights, somehow they make it. You know why? God takes care of them. God watches out for them. Now notice the ravens don't sow and reap and build barns. Ah, remember the guy who sowed and reaped and built his barns and ended up with nothing? The ravens don't do that. And God takes care of them. God provides for them. And so what Jesus is saying is this. You want to remember something. If you're worried that God is not going to provide for you, he's going to leave you in the lurch, look at the birds. You know, next time you're worried, when you look at your debits and your credits and they're not adding up, when you're looking at the stack of bills and, you know, you're just kind of wondering how in the world we make it, go outside, take a deep breath, look up at one of the telephone lines, at one of the doves or the birds that are hanging out there. Who knows, maybe even a crow will fly by and you can have a, a real spiritual experience. But understand something, God takes care of them. God takes care of them. You know, I, I think, how in the world do birds survive in the Sonoran Desert? Where do they get their water? How do they stay out of the heat? I don't know all those things, but God does. No shortage of birds around here, right? Guess what? God's going to take care of you as well. It's a picture of provision. Next time you see a bird, remember, God's going to provide for you. Secondly, look at verse 25. Jesus gives us another illustration. Which one of you, by worrying can add one cubit to his stature. If then you're not able to do the least, why are you anxious for the rest? Well, this idea of adding a cubit to your stature. I, I remember uh, when I was in adolescence, I, I was what you called a late bloomer. When I was a freshman in high school, I was five foot even. And I thought I was going to be like Danny DeVito for the rest of my life. And then in the summer, between my freshman and sophomore years, I grew six inches in three months and uh, you know, continued on from there. Well, all the worrying in the world wasn't going to speed up that process, right? I, I couldn't add a cubit to my stature by worrying about it. It was going to happen or not happen, but it was completely out of my hands. The other aspect of this in, in the Greek, it seems to indicate that the idea of adding a cubit to your stature is like adding a day to your lifespan. You can't do it, no matter how hard you try, no matter how hard you exercise, no matter how many Pilates you do, no matter how many massages you have, no matter how many kale shakes you drink in the morning. Guess what? Psalm 139 says that every day of your life is written in God's book. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows the day on the program of your memorial before it's even printed. And you can't change it. That's in God's hands. So why worry about it? Oh, don't misunderstand me. It doesn't mean that we don't take care of ourselves and try to make the quality of our lives while we're here as best we can. Our temple, our body is a temple of the Lord. I, I think it's uh, really sad how many of us take lard and put it on the walls of the temple. We don't want to do that for sure. But understand something, all the exercising and all the dieting and, and all of the latest things, whether you're keto friendly or not, all of those things, sooner or later, it's not going to add a day to your lifespan. So why? worry about it. In fact, those who are involved in the health profession will tell you that you can do all those things. You can get up early and exercise. You can eat all the right things. You can stay away from fast food and everything else. But if you allow anxiety to be the constant background noise in your mind, you're shortening your lifespan. In fact, that'll probably do more damage to your immune system, to your heart system, to everything you've got going than even smoking a pack of cigarettes a day. So why worry about it? You can't add a single cubit to your lifespan. Jesus said, if you can't do the least, why are you anxious for less? Notice the third checkpoint here. Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. 
And I'll tell you, not even Solomon in all his glory was arrayed like one of these. If God so clothes the grass which today is in the field and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? Well, (laughs) we can see another checkpoint. You want to make sure in your mind that God's going to take care of you? Look around at the beautiful environment that we live in here. You know, I realize that living in Tucson is sort of an acquired taste. You know, you, you have to kind of get used to it. I remember coming here from Southern California to go to the U of A, and first all I saw was dirt and rocks. You know, but after a while, you start noticing the cactus, and you start noticing the beauty of the Catalina Mountains, and you start noticing the sunsets and so forth. And after a while, it kind of grows on you. After a while, you see beauty all around you. Well, what God is saying in this is, look at the beauty all around you and realize something. It's beautiful on purpose. It's beautiful to remind you that God, just as he takes care of this environment, just as he takes care of keeping everything in balance, he's going to do the same for you. Oh, you of little faith. (laughs) That's where anxiety comes in, right? You know, you can't trust God and not trust God at the same time. One or the other is going on, right? We kind of have this battle in our lives. You know, I think in Mark chapter 4 and verse 35, the story of Jesus telling his disciples to go across the Sea of Galilee. Jesus is so exhausted, he's asleep in the back of the boat. Then a storm comes up. They're having waves break over the sides of the boat. It's a green water situation, they call it, when you're in real big trouble out in a sea like that. The disciples are bailing for their lives. They notice that Jesus is still asleep, and they freak out. And they say, Master, do you not even care? We're about to die. We're as good as dead in the original language. And Jesus wakes up, and he rebukes the wind and the waves. It can be completely calm. People disciples are looking at each other they've gone from you know hyperventilating holding their buckets and suddenly all you can hear is the gentle lap of the sea against the side of the boat and jesus looks at him and said oh you a little faith why did you doubt well, i raised my hand and said uh you know green water situation waves breaking over the bow drowning in the sea of galilee that's why I, if you're asking lord i can help you out with that one Why does Jesus ask that question? (laughs) Because he said to his disciples, let's cross over to the other side. He didn't say, hey, let's go halfway across the lake and die. Guess what? God says the same thing to you. The good work he began in you, he's going to be faithful to complete till the day of Christ Jesus. He's going to see you through. He's going to sustain you. He's not going to take you halfway through and go, oh, I'm sorry, I've got to go manage this quasar over here. Good luck. No, he said, I will never leave you and never forsake you. (laughs) Interesting, the scripture says he makes that statement regarding the idea of not letting the love of money take over our lives. God's going to be there. He's going to provide for us. So how does this impact us practically? Look at verse 29 here real quick as we wrap up. It says, and do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink, nor have an anxious mind. Uh, the word anxious there is really interesting. The only time this word occurs in the New Testament, by the way, it comes from the same root word that we get our term meteor from. <laughs> now, now uh, the commentators, you know, scratch their heads and are puzzled about that. And, you know, why in the world you have a meteoric mind? You know, what, is, what, what does that mean? And, and, you know, some say, well, you know, it's, uh, meteors are high in the air, so, you know, you're, you're looking up uh, above and you're not paying attention. You know, they have all these theories. I don't know. You know, when I see meteors, you see a meteor shower every once in a while, falling star. You know what I'd say about meteors is their defining characteristic? They burn out in a hurry. They burn out in a hurry. Man, if you let anxiety start taking over your mind, you're going to burn out in a big time hurry. Jesus said, don't have an anxious mind for all these things. The nations of the world seek after, and your Father knows that you need these things. But seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added to you. Do not fear, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell what you have and give alms. Provide for yourselves money bags which do not grow old, a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches nor moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Notice Jesus emphasizes seeking the kingdom of God and everything else is going to be added to you. 
What does it mean to seek the kingdom of God? What is this kingdom of God Jesus is talking about here? Well, in Romans chapter uh, 14 and verse 19, we are told the kingdom of God isn't eating or drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. What Jesus is saying is, seek the blessings of heaven. Seek those gifts that no one can take away from you. Seek the eternal. Seek the spiritual. Seek the permanent things. Righteousness. A right relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. Peace. The peace that passes understanding. That can guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. When we realize how much God loves us. The joy unspeakable and full of glory that we can have within our lives when we realize as Christians the best is yet to come. If you want to win over worry, three things. First of all, look out. <laughs> worry is an enemy not to be underestimated. Do you spend too much of your time worried with the what ifs going through your mind? Use that as an opportunity to turn to God. Cast your cares on Him because He cares for you. Secondly, look around. God has provided all these not-so-subtle hints in the creation that the Creator of all things can handle the problems in your little world as well. And mine too. And finally, look up. Oh, I love what Psalm 16 says about this. Blessed be the Lord the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You maintain my lot. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. I have a good inheritance. The person who has that perspective isn't going to live their life saying, what if, or if only. They're going to say, wow, God, you've been good to me. That person is going to be rich in the things that matter. The peace of God is going to give them holy boldness to face any challenge that comes their way. Lord, thanks so much that you love us. Thanks so much for taking care of us. Uh, and, and, and we're so funny, Lord. I'm sure in your eyes, you're so obvious and so powerful and so glorious and so good. And yet, even those of us who know you and love you sometimes think somehow uh, you've gone on vacation. Somehow you've ignored us. Somehow you're going to drop the ball. Lord, I thank you that in the entire history of creation, you've never said oops once. And that includes what you're doing in our lives. So I do pray for those that are overwhelmed with worry, overwhelmed with concern, and maybe with very valid reasons. No matter what the reason, Lord, the prescription, the response is the same. To cast our cares on you because you care for us. To be anxious for nothing. But in all things, through prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, letting our requests be made known to you and the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Allow us to take in that as part of our inheritance as your dearly loved children. Give us that peace, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you all please stand? May the Lord love on you this week. May he give you the wisdom to be able to see through different eyes, the eyes of gratitude, not of grief, the eyes that see God's provision, not the lack that you might think you have within your life. Remember something, in God's economy, if you need it, you got it. If you don't have it, you don't need it. Trust in him and see him work in a wonderful way as he moves within your life not only to bless you, but make you a blessing in these anxiety-ridden times. In Jesus' name, amen.